It is time for the first minor league update of the season. We're starting things off in AAA with the Nashville Sounds, playing host to the Oklahoma City Dodgers. Austin Biebens Dirks gets the start for the Nashville Sands, and he'll be opposed by the right-hander Mitchell White of OKC. We'll start things off with the Sands at the dish. It's Henry Ramos, brother of Elliot Ramos, who draws himself a walk, so he'll be on first base with one out. Next batter up is Sam Travis, the former Red Sox prospect as he hits a ball off the scoreboard in left field it's going to be second and third for the sounds brings up apostle who is then going to hit a ground ball to third base that'll score a run as it's an rbi grind at and the sounds jump out to a one nothing lead in the top half of the second it's going to be matt Beatty who draws himself a walk after that it brings up rex who grounds into a 5-4-3 double play and that's two down in the inning. Next batter up would be Cody Hosey, who does what he did at his college career. Tulane hits a long home run, ties the game up at one. Cody Hosey, the Dodgers draft pick, puts that one on the grass. It's a 1-1 game. Bottom of the third now, Apostle at the plate is going to hit one down the left field line. That's going to get into the corner, and he has himself a two-bagger. In scoring position, brings up Ryan Doro, who is going to smack one into center field, and that's going to drive an Apostle from second base as it gives the Nashville Sounds a 2-1 lead in this ballgame. Move things on to the top half of the sixth inning where Terrence Gore came to the plate to lead things off, and he's going to rip one in the left field, base knock for the fleet-footed Gore. After that, it's Jackson who's going to smack one in the right field opposite way. Back-to-back -back base knocks for the Dodgers, and there's two speedy players on base. Then Tyler White, the former Astro, comes up, hits a ball over to third base. Third baseman Doro stumbles with it, so he's only going to be able to get to the runner at first. So it's second and third. They would intentionally walk Connor Joe. And then Matt Beatty comes to the plate and hits a ball at the left field. And that's going to drive in two runs. And OKC takes a 3-2 lead. After that, it is Rex who comes to the plate, hits the ball into center field. And he's going to extend the Dodger lead to 4-2 as the throw into home plate is not in time. That'll end Austin Bieben's Dirk's day, as he is replaced by Luke Farrell, who comes on for the 17th time this season for the Sounds. With one out and runners on first and second, it's going to be Cody Hosey hitting a ball down the left field line. That's going to drive in a run. An RBI double for Hosey makes it a 5-2 lead for OKC. Next batter up is Kiebert Ruiz, who is going to ground out the shortstop. That's two down. A run does come in to make it 6-2, though. And then Rayleigh would go down swinging to finally end the inning. Victor Gonzalez came on in the fifth for the Dodgers, and he would still be on in the, in the bottom of the sixth as Ryan Doro is going to smack one out to right field. That's going to be a base knock. Another hit for him. He had a ton of hits on the day. Eli White, the super utility man, then came up, and he's going to smack one out to right center field. That's going to get down into the gap and double for Eli White, and it's second and third. With two outs now for Rob Refsnyder as he pulls one into left field. Left fielder has some trouble with it, and that's going to allow two runs to come in as the Sounds are chipping away. It's a 6-4 game now as Derek Law comes in in the top of the seventh. And Terrence Gore hits one to deep right center field. Martinez tracking it down. He's a great fielder. Cannot make the catch, though. And then the fleet-footed Gore finds himself in third base to lead off the inning. Later on in the inning, it's Tyler White who's going to hit a ball down the right field line. Ramos could not make the play, and that's going to be an RBI double for him as the lead is now 7-4 for OKC. Johnny Venters came in the game at the top of the eighth, and he's facing Terrence Gore, who Terrence Gore, of all people, almost homered against Johnny Venters. That would have been, uh, maybe I should hang up the cleats moment for Venters, but he proceeds to come back and throw that slider to strike out Gore to complete the inning. So then we move on to the bottom half of the eighth where Jordan Sheffield came on for OKC, facing Ryan Doro, who gets yet another hit in this ballgame. This one down the left field line into the corner. It's going to be a leadoff double for Doro. 
And then later in the inning, Blake Swihart came on to pinch hit, recently sent back down to AAA. And he's going to be jumping on a pitch down the right field line. Lands fair. Doro is going to score. It's a ground rule double. It's a 7-5 to five game now. Brings up Rob Refsnyder, smacks him at the right field. Swihart being aggressive, right fielder having trouble with it. It's now a 7-6 to six game. They have cut the lead down to one. Cody Allen comes on to act as a bridge in the top of the ninth. Got himself into a bit of a jam, but he would get out of it as he strikes at Rex to end the inning. And then that's the bottom of the ninth. Adubre Ramos came on for OKC looking for the save. First batter he's facing is Sam Travis, jumps on the first pitch, they were hugging the lines, so he's able to chop that one into the hole and in the left field for a base knock. Then Apostle comes up, and he's going to clobber one into that left center field gap, up against the wall, a ground rule double, so nobody comes in to score, it's still 7-6, but with nobody out, Second runners on second and third. Anderson Tejada also jumps on the first pitch, and that's going to drive in two as the Nashville Sounds walk it off. Eight to seven is the final score. Anderson Tejada with the walk off RBI, two RBI single. As all three batters in the ninth inning just jumped on the first pitch, Ramos throws three pitches, blows the save as the Nashville Sounds win this game over the Oklahoma City Dodgers. Ryan Dora was player of the game. He was 4 for 4 of the day with three singles and a double. Cody Allen gets the win, and Adubre Ramos obviously gets the loss. Now let's take a look at some of the guys we have at the AAA level who probably aren't going to get prospect profiles, but we do want to highlight a bit about in this minor league update. The first one being Ryan Doro, the player of the game from the highlighted video. He was actually in double A for the majority of the season so far, but we just recently had to call him up because we've had a few injuries that have opened up spots for other people. And he ended up going four for four in that game we highlighted. He's a decent depth player. He just doesn't really have any room for improvement being a deep potential guy. He's got a decent bat. He's a solid infielder. He's decently fast. It's just he's not currently on the 40-man, so he's not being looked at to being added to the 40-man since he's a deep potential and uh, not... We don't have an immediate need for him. Hunter Cole is a guy who was playing quite well in AAA, but he went down with a fractured shin, which is unfortunate and also very unlucky because he has 88 durability, so it's not like he's a guy who's not durable and is going to be getting hurt left and right. He just had a freak injury. Which is a shame because we could have probably used him in the big leagues at this point and he probably would have been there at, by this point considering that I've been calling up and down so many different people and he is a guy who could fit at the big league roster right now. He's a pretty solid bat. He can feel decently well at both corner outfield spots and at first base. Then we have someone like Rob Refsnyder, who at one point in his career was actually looked at as a pretty good prospect for the New York Yankees. He was the AAA second baseman for the Yankees when Steven Drew was their second baseman at the Major League level, and he was just like the worst player I've ever seen. Maybe exaggerating a bit, but he was awful. I hated Steven Drew when he was on the Yankees, and if my old Twitter account was not deleted for uh, DMCA, well, then I would be able to go back and probably show you a 40 different tweets of me being like, just call up Ref Snyder already. But uh, that really didn't end up happening. He had a couple of shots and never really panned out. At this point in his career, he's just sort of a depth utility player. He can play second, first, corner outfield. Uh, we also don't really have anyone in the organization, in the minors, who has great plate discipline. So his plate discipline is definitely one of the better ones we have throughout the organization of guys who aren't already on the Major League roster. Then we have another super utility guy who is even more so of a super utility guy, can play more positions, and Eli White. But the thing about him is that he is a super utility guy in the sense that he can play all these different positions, but he can't really play them all that well, and he does nothing else well either. He's not fast, he can't hit, he's just sort of like a guy who like, I, I can play shortstop, I'm gonna make seven errors a game, but I can play shortstop. And then you've got Sam Travis, who is another guy who, as far as I know, was a pretty highly regarded prospect for the Red Sox at one point, just like Blake Swihart, who we also have with the AAA team. And he's not putting up great numbers for us in AAA, 
Uh, him, Greg Bird, and Ronald Guzman are all around the same overall rating at first base, so I mean, any of them could potentially be a first baseman for us at some point. Right now, Guzman is hitting extremely well in his platoon against right-handed pitching, while Bird is not so much doing his thing against lefties, but we hasn't, he hasn't really gotten too many at-bats. I think he only has like 30 at-bats right now, so we're not going to judge him based on 30 ABs. And Sam Travis is a pretty good bat, mainly against left-handed pitching. He can play a solid defensive first base, and he's still only 25 with a B potential, so you never know what can happen with his development. Uh, as we know, if you've seen multiple franchises from me, I am not opposed to keeping a guy in the minor leagues till he's like 29, 30, and then just being like, all right, time for your first call up now that you're finally good and having a 30-year-old rookie on our team. I've done that many times. Peter Mooney was one last season. Uh, Sam Travis could end up being that guy. Now moving on to the pitching side of things, we've got Edison Volquez, who is the guy who's been around in the major leagues for what seems like forever. Could have sworn I was watching this guy pitch when I was in like middle school. I'm pretty sure I was watching him pitch when I was in middle school. And he is pitching extremely well in AAA for us. The thing is, he is not currently on the 40 man, but we still might see him in the bigs at some point with how not sure our bullpen is and our fourth and fifth starters. You never know what could happen with injuries. So at some point, he might end up in the big leagues this season. Uh, we've also got someone like Austin Biebens Dirks, who is pitching extremely well in AAA as well. His big thing is that he doesn't walk anyone. He has a good walks per nine rating. His stuff is not filthy. He doesn't throw hard. He's just accurate. He's also 34 years old and a deep potential. Uh, he did pitch in 24 games, six starts with the Rangers in 2017. But with that being said, I doubt he's around for more than just this year because he'll be 35 next year's deep potential. Not really someone I want to keep around to have a spot in my organization. Now moving on, we've also got Kyle Cody in AAA. He was a guy who was putting up pretty decent numbers for us. And he is a pitcher that the Rangers organization in real life still seems to have quite a bit of belief in despite not currently being on their top prospects list. He is on their 40-man roster in real life, despite being hurt since 2018. He has not pitched a full season since 2017, barely pitched in 2018. So basically, he was drafted in the sixth round by the Rangers out of the University of Kentucky in 2016. Uh, he was then named the Texas Rangers Nolan Ryan Pitcher of the Year in 2017 for his year in high A ball. And then he missed the first three months of 2018 with right elbow inflammation. Tried to pitch a rehab games. He pitched two games, five total innings in July of 2018. Ended up getting Tommy John later in July. Missed the rest of 2018, all of 2019. And then despite missing all of that year, he was then placed on the 40-man following the end of 2019. Despite never pitching at a level higher than advanced A-ball, and not pitching at all, essentially, since 2017. Because that is a, such an interesting story, and he's also a pretty highly rated or pretty decent prospect in this game for us. He's like a mid-60s B potential guy. I thought about giving him a prospect profile, but we have so many guys in the organization that I want to highlight in a prospect profile that a lot of them probably aren't going to end up getting them, and I'm just going to end up caving and being like, ah, oh, here's this guy in a minor league update video. But as of right now, I just decided Kyle Cody would be a guy we would just get out of the way as like, this is his thing, and since he's already on the 40 man, he's going to get immediately called up in September anyways, so you'll probably end up seeing him in September at some point on that team, maybe getting some some innings in out of the bullpen. Colby Allard is a guy we already know about. He made two starts for us in the big so far this season, then he got sent down when Lance Lynn came back from his injury. And Allard also was an absolute stud for us in my San Francisco Giants franchise, MLB 19, if you were around for that. Hopefully he can have another uh, impact like that on our franchise here in MLB 20. Luke Farrell is a reliever putting up good numbers for us out of the pen in AAA. Uh, yeah, he put up good numbers out of the pen in the 12 and a third innings pitch he had with Texas in 2019 as well. His ratings aren't anything special, but he's another guy where, like, you never know what can happen if he has a few good years of development in the minor leagues. 
We've also got Cody Allen, former stud closer for Cleveland, now on a minor league deal with us after getting DFA'd by the Angels last season. And yes, I did change his contract in-game to a minor league deal. He's making 500000 rather than the $8 million he was making because for whatever reason, in MLB 20, they had him on the same contract that he signed with the Angels for the 2019 season, which one, he got DFA'd from, so that contract no longer exists. And two, even if he did finish the season with the Angels, that contract wouldn't exist still because it was a one-year deal. So in MLB 20, they had him on a deal that one, he got DFA'd from, so it doesn't exist, and two, wouldn't have existed even if he finished the season. So it goes to show you how much paying attention the MLB The Show devs are doing to franchise mode. And with that being said, he is pitching well for us in his closer role at the AAA level. Once again, though, he is a deep potential. You never really know what you're going to get from him. Also, he has an awful walks per nine rating. Not currently on the 40 man. Not sure what his role will end up being on this season's team or if he comes back for next season. Johnny Venters is a guy who I, I signed at the start of the year because I felt like we needed more bullpen help. And we do. It's just he's only been okay, and his ratings have already gone down so much since he's 35 years old that, like, I, I doubt he ends up on the Major League roster. We now shift our focus to the AA team as here at Wagon Man Stadium, the Frisco Rough Riders play host to the Springfield Cardinals. Making the start for the Frisco Rough Riders is Jonathan Hernandez, and he is opposed by Johan Oviedo, the right-handed pitcher of the Cardinals. And we'll start things off with Hernandez on the hill in the top of the third. It's going to be a bloop hit from Plummer. Lands in front of the center fielder Tavares with one out. Next batter up is Dunn as he draws himself a walk. And that's going to be first and second. And then Robertson also draws himself a walk. So the bases are juiced with one out for Montero as he gives one a ride at a deep right field. It's going to be tracked down by Jenkins at the fence and the throw into the cutoff man. And then the third is obviously not in time. So a sack fly makes it a one nothing game. And then Justin Williams would fly out to left field to end the inning. So Springfield has themselves a one nothing lead. We move things on all the way to the bottom of the fifth now. As Sam Huff is going to ground one up the middle for a base knock. After that, it is Steele. Walker, Texas Ranger, draws himself a walk. Next batter up is Diasobel Arias, who hits the ball right back up the middle. That's going to score Huff from second base. Walker moves into third. It's an RBI single for Arias. Makes it a 1-1 tie game. And then... Jenkins would come to the plate, smack one into right field, right fielder gives it a dive, cannot make the play, and Steel Walker is going to move up to home, and he's going to score, slides in, makes it a 2-1 lead for Frisco, but he would end up having to come out of the game, nothing major though, just some forearm tightness, and then later on in the inning, Leody Taveras comes up and smacks one over the shortstop's leaping glove, that's going to score a run, it's now a 3-1 lead for Frisco, we move things on, bottom of the sixth now, Davis Wenzel, the former Baylor Bear, is going to smack one into the right center field gap, that's going to get up against the wall, and he has himself an easy double. So that's leading off the inning, that'll end Oviedo's day, as Steven Gingery, Gingery, I did not look up to say his name, comes in, the left-hander for Springfield. And he's facing Josh Jung, the former Texas Tech Red Raider, draws himself a walk. So first and second, as then Sam Huff hits a hard ground ball at third base. M bobbles it, misses the tag, so he's only able to get Huff at first base. So second and third, Ladarius Clark, who came on to replace Steel Walker, chops one down the line. The jump throw gets nobody, as it's an RBI single. It's now a 4-1 lead for Frisco in the bottom of the eighth. Davis Wenzel comes up again and delivers again. This one's over the fence, this time the left center field gap, as the Baylor Bear makes it a 5-1 lead for Frisco. And then Yoli Rodriguez came on in the top of the ninth looking for the save, and things did not start off well for him. As Justin Williams connects on a pitch, hits it off the side in right center field, it's now a 5-2 game, and then the first baseman, Shania, comes to the plate, hits the ball down the right field line. That's going to be an easy double for him. 
So he's in scoring position with nobody out, and the Cardinals are threatening here, but Rodriguez would clutch up as he strikes out Herrera for out number one. Donovan then comes to the plate, he pops one up the shallow left field for out number two, and then out number three would be Fletcher, who is going to fly one out to left field as Bubba Thompson is camped under it in front of the track, and that's out number three as the Frisco Rough Riders come out on top over the Springfield Cardinals here at Wagon Man Stadium. Davis Wenzel was player of the game. He had a double and a home run on the day. Those were his two hits, as you can see. This game still has the glitch where players on our team have their team's uni on because I'm sure not a single person who works for MLB The Show on their dev team is even aware of this issue. Jonathan Hernandez gets the win for Frisco. Johan Oviedo gets the loss for Springfield. And now we move on to taking a closer look at some of our double-A players. So the thing about our double-A team is that a lot of these guys are B-potential guys who are still a few years away from the major leagues because they're so young, but they could be legit players for us. And because of that, I will not be going super into detail on their ratings because there's quite a few of them that I would like to highlight eventually in prospect profiles and it would defeat the purpose of a prospect profile if I was just like hey here's this guy's ratings right now so I'm not going to do that but we are going to go through some of these guys stats like Bubba Thompson one 80 grade name two he's raking in double a so far he's got a 952 OPS then we've got guys like Steel Walker also 80 grade name also raking in double a Leody's Taver or Leody Tavares He's not raking, but he is hitting well. He's 21, a B potential, and he's already on the 40-man roster, so the game will automatically call him up for September call-ups, but it doesn't matter too much because his option for the season was already used to send him down after spring, so he already has one of the three options used anyway, so it doesn't really matter and when he gets sent back down. Uh, Eric Jenkins is an insane defensive outfielder. Not too much to say else about him right now. Josh Jung is a guy who is going to get a prospect profile probably at some point in this season. If not this season, he'll be like the first guy to get it in 2021. He is a guy who could end up being our starting third baseman in 2021, though. I will talk about that more, obviously, in his prospect profile. Sam Huff, one of the top prospects with the or Rangers organization. I did edit his ratings and his potential because of the game had him as a D potential with ratings that just didn't even come close to matching his scouting report. So I edited those a bit. And also he's probably going to get a prospect profile at some point. Uh, then we've got Davis Wenzel, who is a former Baylor Bear. He's a long hair beard guy. As a fellow long hair and beard guy, I have no choice but to stand. Uh, his numbers are god-awful in AA for us, but his hitting ratings... They are at the point where they could end up being pretty good if he has, like, two, maybe three years of good seasons for us in the minor leagues. He could be one of those, like, C-potential guys that ends up being, like, a pretty good bat for us. And we've also got quite a few guys who went to college in Texas, him being a Baylor Bear. Uh, another guy like Josh Jung with the Texas Tech. There's also a few other of them. Uh, it'd be cool to see them do well for us, considering we are the Texas Rangers, and I just, I love that shit when people go to colleges in, like, Texas, for example, and they end up being, like, a key member of a Texas Rangers team or something. And now if we take a look at the pitching side of things for our double-A team, a lot of these guys are also very young, be potential guys, so I don't want to highlight too much before they get a prospect profile, so we're only going to go over a couple guys on the pitching side of things. Hans Kraus is already a guy who got a prospect profile, so we can go over him. He has been dominant in double-A, as to be expected if you saw how filthy he was in that prospect profile. He's probably going to end up in some point at in uh, he's probably going to end up in AAA at some point this season, probably like July something like that. Uh, Wei J Wong is how Baseball Reference is Baseball Reference says to pronounce this guy's name is a reliever for us in AA. Arizona signed him as an international free agent of Taiwan in 2014, made his debut in 2015 with their organization. Uh, he ended up in the Texas organization as part of the Jake Diekman trade in 2018, and then Texas actually non-tendered him at the end of 2019, and then brought him back in a minor league deal, so that's why he is still with us. 
He's pitching quite well for us in double A, and looking at his ratings, it seems like his curveball is absolutely filthy with that 93 break rating. So he could be an option for us at some point out of the bullpen as just a guy who comes in there with just wipeout stuff for a couple batters. And Cole Reagans, Cole Raggins, I'm assuming it's Reagans, he's been an elite double-A reliever for us this season. Uh, he's been in the pen as a long man despite being listed as a starter. His, his stamina rating is not really what you would like it to be for a starter, and that's why he's in the pen for us where he's been, like I said, elite, a sub-1 ERA, .94 ERA, 1.53 FIP. Uh, he's still pretty raw with his ratings, but he could be a solid multi-inning guy out of the pen for us at some point in the future. And with that being said, that's just going to wrap things up here for the first edition of the Texas Rangers Minor League Update. We are here at like the end of May, so we'll see how these guys' careers progress and see how many of them are back for next season and how they do at the end of this season and whatnot if we see any of them. Uh, throughout the duration of this series. So with that being said, I've been your host Jerseyborn, and I am saying, I very much miss watching Jason Tatum be an absolute superstar.